Turn in your Bibles today, if you will, to the last book of the Bible. I'm continuing a series on the three comings of Christ. This will be the third in a series on the three comings of Christ. The twelfth chapter of the book of the Revelation. I'm always amazed when I'm going to bring one or two messages and the Lord won't let me stop. So I just keep moving forward uh, because there's so much here I don't want to miss it. And I'm grateful for the Lord helping me and helping us out of His Word. I will read the text that I've read for the last two sermons. Some have not heard it. I will give a brief introduction and then a short message today. I know what you just thought, but a short <laughs> message today. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was called up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. And that is interpreted as three and one-half years. Dear Jesus, I want to thank you today for the good memory of those who went to the front lines, paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Thank you for those here in our building today who likewise gave years of their lives in defense of our freedoms. As we've been reminded in the song service today, we're also thankful, Lord, for you who went to Calvary that we might have life. Recognizing that we're born in our trespasses and sins, you also paid the ultimate sacrifice for us, and for that we shall be eternally grateful. Bless us together around your word for these few moments, and we'll thank you and praise you, because we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. We have learned from this chapter that there are some great personage, personages set forth. First of all, in verse number one, there was a great wonder in heaven. We have identified this wonder as the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel, in verse number two, travailed for centuries, trying to produce and to bring forth the Messiah. Standing before the nation of Israel, in verse number three, was the red dragon, another great wonder. Identified in verse number nine as that old serpent called the devil. For centuries, Israel 
was on the radar scope of God, God determined that through that nation he would bring salvation to the world. When the day came and she produced the Messiah, the devil did all in his diabolical power to take the life of the Lord Jesus. We looked at that in our last study. The devil, however, could not stop Israel as a nation. In spite of all of the circumstances of devastation, God supernaturally preserved that nation to eventually bring forth the Messiah. The Bible in verse number 5 reminds us of his birth. And it also reminds us, and I'm glad to report this, of the failure of Satan. F Satan wins some skirmishes, but we know from the scripture he doesn't win the final battle. We do understand in verse number five that he lost the battle to prevent the Messiah from coming. And he also lost the battle in preventing the Messiah from going back to heaven vicariously and victoriously. Because the Bible says in verse number 5 that she brought forth a man child. That's the first coming of the Lord. She brought forth a man child. And he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And here is where once again the devil failed. Her child was caught up unto God and to the throne. That the devil tried to prevent. But the devil went down in failure because Jesus made it safely back to heaven. We move from verse 5 to verse 6 in Revelation 12. And we note that we are now addressing in verse number 6 a time yet prophetic to us, a future time. It is known as the tribulation. It is known as the 70th week of Daniel. And it teaches us that the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God. They should feed her there at three and a half years. The setting is, after the church is taken out, the Antichrist will be revealed, and the three and a half years of his seven-year reign will be a literal hell on this earth. And for the nation of Israel left behind to survive, she will have to flee into the wilderness. We read about it in Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, and other passages of Scripture. God prepares a place for her to flee. Right now, this morning, we are living between verse 5 and verse number 6. This is known in the Bible as a great parenthesis. It is known as the day of grace. It is known as the church age. There are two major events in the book of the Revelation that we learn about that Jesus is responsible for that is not shared with us here in the 12th chapter of the book of the Revelation. Here he's born, he's called up into heaven, and he sits on the right hand of the Father. However, in the book of the Revelation, we learn about two great important events which took place while he was here between Revelation 12, 5, and 6. We move back once again to the first chapter of the book of the Revelation to find out something which will lead us up to the second appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is found in the first chapter of Revelation, verse number 5 where we are told that he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, 
and numerous occasions in the fifth chapter and in the seventh chapter of the book of the Revelation, we see the Son of God, the Messiah, with the prince of the slaughter in his body where he literally went to the cross and he died for us. Now let's deal with that for just a moment. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to die and give his blood on Calvary's cross for us? Let me give you three reasons hurriedly. Number one, it was necessary for him to go to the cross because of the universality of sin. And I want to say it again, it was necessary for Jesus Christ to go to the cross, Revelation 1-5, to love us and to give his blood for us because of the universality of sin. We learn that there are approximately 8 billion people on planet earth right now. Now that's a lot of people. If you look at the total number of people who have lived on planet earth since Adam and Eve in the garden, we are told that there's approximately 108 billion people who have probably lived in the history of the human race. That's a lot of people. <clears throat> Today in the world, only about, we're told, 30%, 30 to 32, 33% of the people who are living on this earth right now, right at this given moment, somewhere around a third of the population identify with Christianity. That means that approximately two-thirds of the human race alive right now on planet earth are lost without Jesus Christ as their personal savior. That's tragic. Then when we scrutinize and we analyze the third of the human race who identify with Christianity, 33%, the numbers of true Christianity comes way down below that. Because not everybody that identifies with Christianity are biblically saved. There are people out there who are cultish who identify with Christianity. There are people out there who, under the auspices of Christianity, will say there are many ways to heaven. And yet we realize and we understand that of the 33% of the people in the world today, many of those are not saved. So what I'm saying is, there is the universality of the lostness of the human race. You look at those populated areas of our world today. China has the largest number of people in the world. They are followed by India. China possesses approximately 18% of the population of the world. Right behind them is India, just close to them. And you think about the religions of these people. Think about Hinduism. A Hinduism is the largest belief system in India. Reincarnation. They believe that you come back as something else after you die. And you say, how terrible that is. But let me tell you what's more terrible than that. For people in America to know the way of salvation and to turn their back upon it. But the truth is, and we need to understand this, the truth is sin is universal. Therefore, the world needs a universal Savior. And there's only one. And his name is Jesus Christ. There are not many ways to heaven. I've debated people before. I've talked to people before. They would try to convince me that all roads lead to heaven. There's only one road that leads to heaven. And 
that's the road of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But the truth is, if we get on an airplane today and fly to any point on the globe, anywhere you choose to go, it makes no difference. Go as far north, east, south, west you want to go. When you get off of the plane, when you fly with people on the plane, after you arrive at your destination, you will have one thing, if nothing else, you will have one thing in common with every individual you meet on the top side of this earth, and that is everybody you meet will have been a sinner or will have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I put some of it in past tense because there are people, I believe, in all points of, of the globe that know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And if they know Christ as their personal Savior, I'm glad to report to you that the sin account is paid in full. Thank God for that. So we need the Savior because of the universality of sin. We need the Savior, secondly, because of the seriousness of sin. Oh, listen to me today, my friend. Sin is serious business. It's serious in this life. Sin destroys. Go down to the jailhouse. Look at the results of sin down there. Go over in the hospital. Many times you'll see the results of sin there. Look out across the cemeteries. You'll see in many instances the results of sin. Look at the broken homes in our country. Our buses this morning will have brought in a large number of young people. They're meeting now in the other building. We're trying to teach them about Jesus. But many, a high percentage of those young people over there in our youth churches today will have come out of broken homes. Why? Because sin is deceptive. Sin is powerful. Sin is destroying, and sin is abroad in our land and in our world. And we need a Savior who's universal because of the seriousness of sin, because sin destroys. But not only does sin destroy now, but sin destroys forever in the life to come. Those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will be condemned forever. If they did not repent of their sins and find forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ, they will pay the ultimate sacrifice forever. While eternity rolls, they will have to pay for their sins in the lake of fire forever and forever. So the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 1, came into this world to take care of the universality of sin. Aren't you glad he came? Boy, I am, I am so thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ took us into consideration and he came down here for us. So in Revelation, we see the Messiah, he came. He came down here to be the sin offering for all of us. You haven't escaped today. If you're a sinner, you can be saved. I'm saying if you're a sinner, you can become a saint. You don't have to die to be saved put in some kind of a special uh, catalog of sainthood. I see a certain religious denomination, they try to take people that have died and they canonize them. And they, they bring them supposedly out of purgatory and they put them into sainthood. Well, my friend, if you read the first chapter of the book of the Revelation, it's very interesting uh, that uh, he has taught us uh, in this chapter that he has made us, I love this, that he has made us saints and, and kings and priests in verse number six, and uh, that we shall reign with him forever and forever. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those that ain't and those that are saints. And if you're saved today, you become a saint. It comes from the word hagios. It comes from the word holy. It simply means the Lord has taken us out of this world. He saved us. He's put us back in this world to be ambassadors of the world to which we're going. 
So Jesus came to be the sin offering. Not only did Jesus stay down here according to the book of the Revelation to take care of our sin, but secondly, in the book of the Revelation, chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus Christ came down here to establish the church. That's not tallest in the 12th chapter. He came and then he went back and he sat down on the right hand of the Father. But now in Revelation, we have much material, many verses of Scripture, reminding us of the importance of the church. Do you realize today that Jesus established the church? Do you know that Jesus is building his church? In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, he said, I will build my church. That's future. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Apostle Paul, after his conversion, went down into Arabia, the Bible teaches us, in the book of Galatians, and also in the book of Ephesians. And he was given the mystery, it's called a mystery, hidden from the foundation of the world. What was the mystery? The church age. The Old Testament saints did not see it. But we are privileged today to be a part of that institution called the church. The church word for the church is, is ecclesia. It means a called out group of people. And Jesus Christ, according to Acts chapter number 20, purchased this church with his own blood. And the church is so vitally important that the first three chapters of the book of the Revelation uh, talks about the church no less than 19 times. So it's important that we understand hurriedly, I've got to close, but it's important that we understand hurriedly some things about this wonderful church. I'm glad to be a part of the church. And I want you to notice, first of all, uh, in chapter number 1, Revelation, verse number 4, he sends this letter to, watch this, the seven churches, and the seven churches in verse 11 are named. Notice the names of them. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea, seven churches. These seven churches represent seven periods of time from Pentecost unto the rapture. These, my friends, were seven literal churches which would come to represent the church age. Now, I want to say this in closing, and I've got to close fast. I need to be closing long, but I've got to close fast. We had a lot of these extracurricular activity, but I want to say this. It needs to be said. How many of you in this building today, how many of you in this building today would like to know for sure, 100% for sure, if you're saved, you'd like to know 100% for sure that you are right in the center of God's will? Would you raise your hand? I'd like to know that to the best of my ability, I am right. Not a trick question. I just want to show you something. I'd like to know to the very best of my ability that I am living, I am walking in the center of God's will because God has a will for all of his children. Well, I want to help you today. Some of you, you may be kindly wrestling with this. What do I do to find God's will? How do I find God's will? How do I know if I am in God's will? I want to give you, uh, and, 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 and don't panic when I say this, I want to give you four or five ways that you can know I'm just going to touch them. It's just like taking a sip of coffee. I'm not going to drink the whole cup. We're just going to take a sip right quick. I want you to follow me. I want to be able to show you, I want you to hear me, that you can know that sitting right here in the Berean Baptist Church today, that in this part of your life, you are in the center of God's will in the church which Jesus Christ died to purchase. Let me give you three or four reasons. First of all, I can tell you that you are in God's will. Those of you right here, I can't say that if people are listening by radio or internet or will be watching this by television, but I can say this to everybody in this building today. You can know right now for sure, 100% for sure, not 99.9 tenths, but 100% for sure, you can know right now that in one area of your life, you are in the center of God's will, and here's the 
reason why. You are sitting in the church which he purchased with his own blood in obedience to the command in Hebrews chapter 10 not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Uh, you probably came to church this morning. You probably noted people mowing their yard, uh, washing the cow and baptizing the mule. I don't know. But I'm here to tell you, you came to church today. And in church right now, I can assure you from the Word of God that you are in the center of God's will because you got up this morning, you got ready, you got in your automobile, you made your way to the house of God, and you followed the scriptural admonition not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. This church which he established is so important that he has commanded us to go to church. You're in church. Congratulations. You're in the will of God by being here. Let me give you a second one right quick. Uh, we did something a while ago that grieves some people and uh, helps other people and brings smiles to other people's uh, countenance. Uh, we actually received an offering. Amen. I didn't see anybody watch that offering plate after they put their money in it until it went down the row behind them. And then they turned around and watched it till the ushers took it out the door. I, I believe that you gave today because you realize this is the church of Jesus Christ. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has blessed and prospered. Congratulations. You're in the church which Jesus established. Revelation 1, 3, vitally important. Uh, uh, the church for which he died. You're in the center of God's will because you came in obedience to his command. And in 1 Corinthians 16, you're in obedience again to the will of God. Those of you that gave this morning, you put in the offering as he has commanded us to do. It is biblical for you to do it. Thus, those of you that put the money in, you're sitting here in a two-fold center of God's will for your life. You went to church. You gave at church. Congratulations. I'm hoping if you didn't give, you'll come in the altar call, get it right. We'll take it before you leave because it's scriptural. It's scriptural to give down at the house of God. Congratulations. You're in the center of God's will. Let me give you a third one. I noticed this morning that we had good singing in our auditorium. Thank God for good singing. Our choir did wonderful uh, and the quartet did wonderful and we had them to do the second verse again because in the house of God which he purchased with his own blood we love to sing about him. Uh, we have H-Y-M but we've got H-I-M. Uh, we sing about the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and let me tell you something. It is biblical. It is scriptural to sing. In Ephesians chapter number 5, be not drunk with wine wherein success, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing to yourselves in psalms and spiritual hymns. My friend, we carried out the fulfillment of Ephesians chapter 5 already in God's house today. Listen, you're in God's will when you come to the church. It's in the Bible. You're in God's will when you give financially. It's in the Bible. You're in God's will. When, when you sing the songs of Zion, that's the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're in the church of Revelation 1 through 3, which he purchased with his own blood. And you're doing exactly what he's asked us to do. Congratulations. You're in the will of God with doing these things. Hallelujah. I got two minutes. I could say two hours. You're not as happy right now, but listen closely. Listen closely. Something else that's got you in the will of God. Something else that got you in the will of God. Right where you sit, we call it fellowshipping. The Bible said in the book of Acts, the first five chapters, you find it over and over, that they continually, daily, steadfastly in fellowshipping. You know what we're supposed to do when we go to the house of God? Talking about changing the oil in the car next week. Oh, no, no. 
You know what we're supposed to do when we come to the house of God? We're to grab the brothers and sisters by the hand and say, hey, I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for being in church today. You're a blessing to me. I want to be a mutual blessing to you. I'm thankful we got a place where we can come and shut this old lost world out and come in here and fellowship with the brethren and the sisters and the saints of God and enjoy good biblical fellowship. That's part of what the church is about. It's about us being here. It is about us uh, giving financially. It is about us singing the songs of Zion. It is about us fellowshipping. Look, when I need fellowship, I don't run towards the bar. When I need fellowship, I don't run towards the world. When I need good fellowship, I make my way down to the house of God, and I'll find some people down there I know that will be there for me. They'll stand with me through thick and thin. They'll pray for me. They'll lift me up in prayer. I know that that's the people I'm going to spend eternity with, so I want to enjoy some of the premature fellowship before before I get home for eternal fellowship and it's down at the house of God and when we go here we're in the center of God's will when we give we're in the center of God's will when we uh, sing we're in the uh, center of God's will when we fellowship we're in the center of God's will and lastly we go into all of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ you say, Pastor, I can't get on a plane and go to another part of the world. You go through financial giving to missions. We go to our Jerusalem. We go to our Jerusalem through our radio station right now. We go to our Jerusalem through the internet right now. We go to our Jerusalem uh, through our television ministry. We go to our Jews Jerusalem through visitation. We go to our Jerusalem through running these buses. Uh, we go to our Jerusalem by inviting people to come and come under the influence of the gospel. Have you ever stopped to think about this? The church is here, and he's given us all of these great truths to let us know that when we patronize his church, we are in the center of his will. We are here because he's asked us to be here. We are here giving because he's asked us to give. We are here singing because he's asked us to do it. We are here fellowshipping because he's asked us to do it. We are here taking the gospel to the best of our ability to our Jerusalem, our Judeas, our Samarias, and eventually to the ends of the world because that is the purpose of the church uh, that he established, Revelation 1-5, with his own blood. Uh, it is here for a purpose, and congratulations, those of you who are attendees today, you have have found God's will for your life at the beginning of this week. Congratulations. What an institution the church is. That's the place we look to when we marry our young and bury our dead. It's a place we look to for instruction. It's the place we look to and believe we'll find some people there that will minister to us that we won't find anywhere else. You see, everything else will be what we call fine weather friends. They'll be with us when the sun's shining real bright, maybe. But when the going gets tough, you may not be able to find them. But it's the body of Christ that sticks together. And the Bible, and I'm finished. Don't say amen, but the Bible, the Bible calls this church a spiritual building. A spiritual building. <laughs> We're a brick in the building. You go out here in the field and you take a brick out there. You can't leave the parking lot and say, well, I established my church today. I got a brick out there. You know what causes us to have a place to worship? It's a bunch of bricks cemented together. And hear me well. You can go out in the field and you can move a loose brick. But you're going to have a hard time trying to pick this building up and move it. This building is cemented together. And you know what the devil hates? He hates a church body that's cemented together to the extent that it can't be moved by Satan and the powers of hell, that it's constantly moving forward with, with heaven in view, marching to Zion. That's what we are. 
And we are a part of the church. In Revelation, the first three chapters, we have his death for the world. We have his church for the world. We'll continue there later. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be a part of his church. I'm glad to be a part of his body. I'm glad to be a recipient of the blood that was shed and the cross endured that we might be made a part of this wonderful, wonderful entity we call the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I wonder if he would be here today and you'd say by an upraised hand, Pastor, I've never been saved. I know he shed his blood for me and I realize uh, that I can't get to heaven by what I'm doing. I've got to trust what he did for me and Quite honestly, I'm not sure I've ever done that, and I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up high and let me pray for you? There might be a question about whether or not you've ever been saved. Would you slip your hand, head, uh, hand up high and let me pray for you? Secondly, how many would be here today and you'd say, you know, God spoke to me. I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I'm so appreciative to be a part of the church that Jesus died for. And uh, hands all over the building. Thank you, God bless you. And I wonder if you'd be here and you'd say, you know, uh, I, I just have the desire. I, I just need to draw a little closer to the Lord. He's so wonderful to me. Uh, he's letting me be a part of his church. Uh, I'm so gra glad today that I can fellowship with the saints. I'm so glad I got a place I can come to. I'm so glad I got a place where I can hear the truth. I'm so glad I got a place uh, where I can hear the good singing and, and, and see the church of Jesus Christ in action. But my, my life is just not what it needs to be. Preacher, pray for me. Would you slip your hand up all over the building? Thank you, Lord. You see all of these hands today. Help us to have a desire, dear Jesus, to be in a close fellowship and communion with you as you have ordained it to be. Lord, don't allow us to allow the adversary to slip into our lives. And Lord, draw our spiritual life cold to a place of coldness and indifference. Help us today to the very best of our ability to enjoy being saved because we realize and recognize who you are and what you've done for us. Keep your hands upon us in Jesus' name. Others need to come. Would you slip out while the quartet sings this stanza? Thank God for the church. Thank God we can be a part of it. Would you come right now? Thank God that he's here to help us and minister to us. Stands up.